I want to come back to the book of 2 Kings, and I'm just going to read this time just uh, one verse. And um, you don't have to stand. Just listen to this one verse from 2 Kings uh, chapter 2, verse 14. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elisha crossed over. Amen. Again, I want to say just a word about our previous uh, few days together. We had uh, the Western Diocese here at Christ Temple, and I thank Christ Temple so much for the wonderful spirit of his hospitality that you uh, extended to those who were our guests. We had uh, guests here from all the way from San Diego and from the Bay Area. We had a couple of full days of church services from nine in the morning to almost uh, nine o'clock at night. And uh, I cannot tell you how many years it's been since I was at church at nine o'clock at night. I have reached the age in life where at nine o'clock at night, I'm usually sound asleep, sound asleep. But the Lord blessed and we were uh, uh, blessed by our fellowship and all the good things that happened. We certainly want to thank uh, Joe and Tammy for the wonderful lunch that they provided. It was a very, very scrumptious lunch. And we uh, praise God for his gift. Or is it it's really Joe? Not just Let Joe get all the credit? Okay. It's uh, really Joe's gift of catering that he has. So if you want to uh, uh, use a good caterer, I'd like to recommend Joe to you. He does a he, he does a good job, and he's very reasonable. Very, as a matter of fact, I don't, I don't see how you made any money on that one, but that's your business, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, even though we come to the service this morning perhaps somewhat uh, tired, a little worn in body, I'm grateful that even though that I am worn in body, I'm not worn in spirit. And uh, I, I just tell you that when it comes to the Lord, even though my body may be worn, I don't like to half step when it comes to the worship of our God because God's been good to me. He's brought me through another week, brought us to this hour, and we have the wonderful privilege of gathering with God's people and blessing his holy name. This morning, I want to share with you from the Old Testament and I'm, I'm looking at one of the characters in the Old Testament whose story is just extremely dynamic and dramatic, uh, a, a story that can grip your heart. And um, I, I find that when I read it, I'm always just kind of amazed at what God does and how that he is the same yesterday, today, and for evermore. And when you think about drama, you know, we kind of live here in what drama headquarters. And when you think about Los Angeles and Hollywood and the Culver City and all those environs uh, where they make the drama, but this is a dramatic story from the word of our God. Um, it's a story also, though, that gives us hope in turbulent times. And we are certainly living in turbulent times. I got an email this week from a financial advisor, and the financial advisor said to me, uh, a person that kind of helps with some retirement kind of planning, and the person said to me, Bishop Lindsay, we are living in a day of great uncertainty. And uh, those of us who've got a nickel or two in the stock market, we know that we are living in a time of great uncertainty. At one day, you can look, pick up the uh, report about the stock market and you say, well, maybe I can see my way clear. And then the very next day, you look again and you say, I'm not so sure I'm going to make it because there's a lot of turbulence. It's up 
and down. And this year not only has turbulence in terms of our economy, but we've got judicial in turb turbulence with what we hear coming from the Supreme Court these days. Now, it seems that they have cleared the way for every Tom, Dick, and Harry who wants to strap on a, a 45 and walk up and down the street, uh, that it's just open season, even though our land is plagued with more unnecessary gun violence than ever before, but it seems that's the way we're going. And then to have uh, 50 years of case law uh, overturned when the Roe versus Wade is overturned, people are upset, people are disturbed, and we're living in a time of each direction we look in. The war in Europe, there is just uncertainty politically, economically, we can't seem to get over COVID, so we're wondering about our health this morning. Uh, there is uncertainty in every direction. In the church, in America, in our world, every direction that you and I turn, there is a certain amount of uncertainty. Well, uncertainty is not new to the mankind. We live through other periods of uncertainty. And this morning in 2 Kings uh, chapter 2, Israel is at a moment of uncertainty in her history. You know about Israel to the degree that Israel had sort of an up and down, in and out relationship with God. There were times when Israel was hard after God. They were pressing their way to follow the Lord and to walk in obedience. But then there were other times when they allowed the idol gods of the surrounding nations to be introduced to Israel. And before you know it, the hearts of the people were turned away from the true and living God. And they began to worship the idols of the nations around them. And whenever that happened, God would step back and allow judgment or the consequences of their decisions to fall on them. And when those consequences fell on them, bad things would happen in the land. This was a time when they had a man on the throne of Israel. His name was Ahab. And the Bible says of Ahab, he was more wicked than all those who had gone before him. So when he decided to go away from the Lord God, he decided to go away big time as it were. He wasn't going to half step. And he allowed Baal to be introduced. He began to worship Baal. And then he married a woman whose name you're somewhat familiar with. What was her name? Jezebel. And she brought in her wicked religion and she set that up and established it in Israel. And again, they caused the people of God, the Jewish people to go astray. As a matter of fact, things got so bad that there was a great contest. Elijah said to Ahab, he said, you get all the prophets of Baal together. And there were 450 prophets of Baal, 450 ministers for Baal. And Baal wasn't even supposed to be in the land of Israel. That's what the other nations worship. They were supposed to be true to their God, Jehovah. But they had strayed. And he said, you gather all the prophets of Baal together and meet me on Mount Carmel, and we're going to have a showdown on Mount Carmel. So they gathered there on the mountain, and it was 450 prophets of Baal, and Elijah was standing alone. Baal, 450, and uh, Elijah steps up and says, Here's the way we're going to decide who will be and who is the true God. He says, we're going to prepare a sacrifice. You get your bull and you bring him and we're going to offer this sacrifice. We're going to lay him on the altar. And whichever uh, God, whichever one answers by fire, when we pray, if, if the sacrifice is and the fire falls from heaven, then we will know that he is the Lord God. The prophets of Baal, the Bible says, they prayed from morning to noon. Not only did they pray from morning to noon, but they worked themselves up into a frenzy. 
They danced around their altar, that bull that they had laying upon the altar. They danced, they shouted, they called on Baal. They even cut themselves to indicate their sincerity. So here you've got these 450 prophets of Baal and they are bleeding. Their blood's running down their backs, their faces, because they're trying to get their God to answer and consume the sacrifice. Demonstrate that he is indeed the God of gods. Well, about noon, nothing's happened. They've been in prayer for several hours now. And so finally, Elijah, the man of God, he steps forward, and the Bible says that he repaired the altar of the Lord, meaning that he arranged the stones and brought them together and put to, got, brought some structure to the altar of God. And then he put his sacrifice. He laid his bull that he was going to offer unto the Lord God. But he not only laid the bull on the altar after he repaired it, the Bible says that he dug a trench around the altar and then he had them to bring barrels of water and they poured barrels of water on the sacrifice. And they did that three times because Elijah wanted them to know that there's no sorcery, there's no trickery involved here. There wasn't any way that he was going to do something undercover, some kind of sleight of hand and cause fire to magically appear. So they pour this all, water on the altar and they pour it on there until there, the trench around the sacrifice is filled with water. Then Elijah steps forward and he says, Lord God, Yahweh, let it be known that you are God and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear my prayer, O Lord. And when he uttered those words, hear my prayer, O Lord, the Bible says that the fire fell from heaven and it burned up the sacrifice, it burned up the wood, it burned up the stones, it consumed all the water. And when the people saw the power of the living God, they had to fall on their faces and say, the Lord, he is God. It's so good to serve a God who's alive and well, amen, who is able to answer by fire, who is able to hear my prayer and intervene in my circumstances because he has all power in his hand. Well, now this mighty man of God, he's walked among the people of God, he's ministered to the nations, he started a school of the prophets, but his time is up. So it doesn't make any difference who we are, or, or, or what our title, what our position is, there comes a time when our time is up. And we've got to make a transition from this life into the next. So he had reached the end of the journey. The nation is facing an uncertain time, an uncertain future. He has been the voice of God to the people. What will happen when he moves off the scene? Well, prior to his moving, uh, preparing to, or uh, realizing that his time is up, he had called a young man into the service, into uh, who was now walking with him and working with him, a young man by the name of Elisha. We've got Elijah, and he calls a man with the name of Elisha. And Elisha had been his companion, and they had walked together, they had ministered together, and he had trained his replacement. The homegoing of Elijah, the older man, is near. And so the older man says to Elisha, stay here and at Bethel. Stay here and just 
just camp out here as it were. But Elisha says, as the Lord lives, I'm not going to leave you. And this was a kind of a test to see how committed he was, to see how determined he was. So they are going to visit these schools of the prophets that Elijah had set up. So when he would not stay, well, Elijah, Elijah says, well, I'm going to Bethel. And so they walked on over to Bethel, a, a few miles away, and uh, there he met with the, the prophets, those young men who were sort of in seminary or Bible college. He came to visit with them, and he says to Elisha, stay here, and I've got to go to Jericho. Uh, but Elisha again says, I will not stay here, but where you are going, I'm going to go. He was determined to follow. He was determined because he had a heart that was committed. I want to say to you this morning, so often on our journey spiritually, there are forces and voices that tell us, stay here. Instead of pressing on instead of having the kind of commitment and determination it's sort of easy to begin to follow the lord and get stuck somewhere a whole lot of people get stuck right where they get on board you know we're kind of like the little boy who um went to bed one night and during the course of the night he fell out of bed and uh, fell on the floor and his his mommy says to him the next day well how did you fall on the floor he said well i fell on the floor because i slept too close to where i got in amen and there are a lot of people who when it comes to the things of the lord they never really move beyond giving the preacher their hand getting their name on the membership roll, but they never move on into the depths of the Christian life. They never really develop a love for the word of God. They ne that never becomes a part of their experience where they begin to have those daily times with God and they learn how to pray and you know, they like to hear the preacher pray or maybe that mother pray or that deacon pray, but God wants to hear from your heart. And you really, nobody really can pray like you ought to be praying because there's something about God. His relationship with all of us is unique. He can talk to you in a way that nobody else can talk to you. Or he can have a very unique relationship with every single one of us. And you don't know that until you press on. Until you say, I'm not going to stay here, but I'm going to go on in the journey. I'm going to grow up in the faith. And this is the reason that we have so many babes in Christ. You know, people can stay around the church a long, long time, never get out of diapers. And you know, if you got a child, uh, 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 did Eric, I thought Erica came, is Erica back there? If, if that little fella that she has, and Mark, uh, if that little fella doesn't get out of diapers pretty soon, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because it ain't normal for you to, you know, be three and four and five years old and still wearing, that just not normal. But you know, that's what happens spiritually to us, isn't it? We just kind of stay right where we are. So the older man testing Elisha, the younger man who's going to follow, he kept saying, stay here. But Elijah said, oh no, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to see what God is going to do. So they go and they visit, and then Elijah, uh, the older man says to Elisha, the younger man, he says, well, I'm going to the Jordan. And uh, he asked uh, Elisha, what do you want? And he said, I want a double portion of your spirit. Uh, I've seen how God has used you and how God has ministered and how you have spoken into the life of the nation and reminded the people of God of their relationship and how they are to walk before him. Well, I want a double 
portion of your spirit. What do you want from God this morning? Now, a lot of people say, well, I want a, I want a bigger car. I want a nicer home. Well, uh, those material possessions are nice and praise God for them, but God has something more than some material blessing for you. Many times, men and women today are after God's hand. What can God do for me? What can God give me? But God wants you to be after his heart. God wants you to know him. God wants you to have a heart and, a, and an attitude like Paul the apostle who said, I want to know him. I want to have an intimate relationship with him. And I tell you that when you get the heart of God, when you go after God's face, as it were, when you go after this relationship, this personal, intimate, knowing and walking with God, when you go after that, you'll get what's in his hand because God knows how to take care of his children. You know, there are some children, most of us in here probably got some children. And, and, and you know, there's something about those children who come around and are kind of attentive and look like they, you can count on them. You ever find yourself slipping them a little something that you didn't give the one who doesn't come around? Amen. You know, he, he, why, don't, why don't you just uh, take this? And, and, and that, that's those who are near get some special blessings because that proximity, that nearness, the, the, the depth of that relationship sometimes opens you up and opens them up for some special favors, some special blessings. And then when you walk more closely with God, you know his promises. And so when you find yourself in a jam, you're not using God like you use your spare tire. You only call on him in an emergency. But when you walk more closely and the relationship is developed more deeply, you find that there is a fruit that comes from that deeper knowledge and walk with God. So Elisha says that I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah says to him, you want a double portion of my spirit? You ask a hard thing. But he says, I make this promise. If you are with me and if you see me taken away, if you see me taken in my transition, then you will receive the answer to your request. And sure enough, as they walked on a little further, God intervened and God came for his servant, Elijah, and he caused him to be transitioned. He said all of a sudden the heavens opened and there were chariots of fire and there were horses who were ringed by fire. This is where the drama really gets big and you open your eyes and say, how can it be? But God is able to do whatsoever he wills. He, after all, he created the world and everything that's therein. It's a small thing for God to take his servant home in this most dramatic way. So Elijah makes this transition and Elisha sees it. And as he uh, makes that transition, the mantle, the cloak that he's carrying, probably a sleeveless garment, it falls from his shoulders and falls back to the earth as Elijah ascends into the heavens to be with our God. So Elisha goes over and he picks up the mantle or the cloak that has fallen from the shoulders of Elijah. He rolls it up and he comes back to the river Jordan and there on that river Jordan because Elijah had used that mantle to strike the water and the waters that opened and they had gone across on dry land and so now Elisha comes back to that water and he wants to know where is the Lord God of Elijah and will the same thing happen will he be able to take off that mantle and now also strike 
the waters of the river Jordan, what will happen? Well, he picks up that mantle, comes back to the water, and praise God, the God of Elijah is alive and well. He says there that he also strikes the waters, and when he strikes the water, this is the servant of Elijah, Elisha, he strikes the water, and when he strikes the water, the waters of the Jordan, they back up to the right and to the left, and then he walks across on dry land. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Well, the Lord God of Elijah is alive and well. And in times of turbulence, when everything is being turned upside down, in the midst of all of the confusion and the chaos and uncertainty of our world, it's good to know that our God is still on the throne. That he's not somewhere sleeping, he's not somewhere napping, but he still sits high and he still looks low and he is yet able to make a way for his people. He's still able to make a way for anyone who trusts him and he's able to bring us through. When others are wringing their hands and wondering how can I make it? What is going to happen? Where is the Lord? The Lord is where he is. He is on high and he is in charge. And he's the God who promises us, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. The servant of the Lord may die and be transitioned, but the God of Elijah is alive and he's well, and you can call on him. It doesn't make any difference what the times are. It doesn't make any difference who's in the White House, whether it's a Trump or whether it's a Biden or whether it's an Obama, it doesn't make any difference. God is yet in charge and his hand is not short. His ear is not heavy. He is able to take us through. So in times of uncertainty, in times of transition, there is one that we can, you don't have to stay awake at night if you don't want to. You can, you know, it's no use, someone said it's no use me staying up and God's up too. I might as well let him stay up and uh, he's able because uh, uh, he's the one who, uh, Hoah has the whole world in his hand. Everything is under his power. He's Lord, and that means master. He is sovereign. That means he's in charge. He is over all. So why should I be upset and falling to pieces and going to pieces when I can put my hand in the hand of God. I can open my heart to the presence and the peace of God and have a peace that passes all understanding. Yes, I can walk with him. I can trust him. I can depend on him because there's one thing about our God. He's not a fair weather friend. He will be there. He'll be there all the way. He'll be there in the end. He'll be there from the beginning because he's God over all. Elisha asked the question, where is the Lord God of Elijah? The one who has great power. He got back to the Jordan and found out that the God of Elijah, his forefather, the God of our forefathers, the God who brought us through some difficult days, brought us through from uh, slavery, brought us through Jim Crow, brought us through the civil rights of the 60s, brought us through Mr. Trump and all of his shenanigans. That God is still alive. He's still very well. And all he wants us to do is trust him. Put your hand 
in the hand of the God. And sometimes I just kind of bask in this, says, he loves me with an everlasting love. Now, I believe that Pearl loves me a lot. And, and I really believe that it would be hard for her to write me off. I really do believe. But, you know, I've seen a whole lot of other folk that have been in love, too. And they reach a point down the road somewhere where they decide to do what? Go their separate ways. And you just wonder, how in the world did they break up? I thought they were so in love, couldn't keep their hands off each other. But they broke up. But when you put, get, put your heart in the hand of God, he loves you with an everlasting love. We're going to sing on Christ the solid rock this morning as a hymn of invitation. And know this, that our God never fails. He's with us. He is for us. He abides forevermore. He abides forevermore. And he's willing to give us the victory because he's a God who never fails. You are here today. Perhaps you have not trusted Christ as your Savior. We would invite you to do so this morning. Perhaps you're not connected to his church. We would invite you to make that connection today. Or perhaps in your life, there's something else that you would like to bring to the altar for prayer and say, Lord, help me. Lord, go before me. Lord, help me to live in the light of your great love and the fact that you're a God who never fails. The altar is open. Would you stand with me as we sing together? On Christ, the solid rock. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Hymn number 110, if you want to pick up the blue book there, or it should pop up there on the monitor, and we can sing together. My hope is built on nothing less 